Um, hello. Hello. Um, I know I'm speaking through a translator over there. Hello. How you doing? Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, apologies in advance uh, to him, um, but also to all of you. Um, how many of you can actually like understand me when I speak English directly? Okay, that's good. Okay, cool. So, because I I've done these before, where like no one in the audience knows English, which is completely fair enough, and it means that if I make a bad joke, it takes about four or five seconds for people to groan, um, and that throws me off. I like a, I like a quick groan. I like a, I like a groan to come quickly. Um, my name's Mike. Um, I am a game developer. Um, I've been uh, making games now professionally for 10 years. Uh, so I started making um, PS2 and Wii shovelware games, kind of those, those cheap, horrible games that you saw in your favorite video game store. I was making those. Um, that, those, were, those were my pride and joy. Um, I then went and worked on Facebook games, mobile games for a little while, back when Facebook was the future of gaming. Can you remember that? that was, those were good times. Uh, for about two years while it lasted. Um, <laughs> and now uh, now I'm in indie, so I made a game called Thomas Was Alone, uh, which was a rectangle, platforming, feeling, slightly pretentious, a little bit hipster. Um, I made that. Uh, that kind of let me go off and do my own thing and, and make games. I made Volume, which was a stealth game. I made Earthshape, which was this collaboration with Google uh, for uh, VR equipment they were making. Um, and then the most recent game is Subsurface Circular. And that's what I want to talk about uh, today, it's really interesting going on after the chat from Horizon because a, Horizon's amazing, but significantly bigger uh, than anything I've ever made. Um, this is a different kind of talk. This is a talk about a much smaller game made by a much smaller team. Um, I've ripped off, ironically, the structure of a Horizon Zero Dawn talk that I saw a few months back. Uh, so that should be fun, but I'm going to do it for a much smaller game, and we'll see if that works or if it's terrible. I hope there's stuff in here that's useful uh, to any indies in the audience who are making these kind of smaller games. Even though we're a bit more established than, than a lot of indies, because we've had some kind of some success in the past, I think there's a lot of structural things in terms of how we make our games that, that may be useful, hopefully. Um, I'm not going to use the laptop. I'm going to use the amazing clicker they gave me. Boom. I um, <laughs> still think that's cool. Um, so what is Subsurface Circular? Subsurface Circular is a game. Um, it is a game that we've, we made uh, over six months. Uh, it came out in August. I'm just unlocking my phone with one finger here so I can bring up my notes. There we go. It's made, it was made in six months, came out in August. Um, it's been pretty well for us. Uh, the idea is that you play as this robot detective on a train uh, lots of other characters get on and off this train as it's going around below a futuristic sci-fi city, and you're investigating a disappearance. Or actually, as it turns out, several disappearances and kind of uncovering this mystery of why robots are disappearing. It's played um, as a text adventure primarily, uh, so you have these uh, dialogue conversations, lots of branching stuff, lots of player choice. You're kind of working your way through these, uh, this detective story, unlocking focus points, which are the uh, kind of the inventory of the game. Uh, they're words and things that are kind of uh, important to the, to the mystery you're trying to solve. And you work your way through that, and you have, hopefully, a good time. Um, the game's done well for us. It came out, as I said, in August. It had made back its development costs in the first month. Um, it's reviewed very well. It's got a 96%, I think, Steam review score. So it's been positively received really, really well by the community, which is all very, very cool. Um, it's even more cool given how we made it uh, and how we got it done. I'm just going to very quickly, I, I don't think it's going to work, but I'll show you the first frame of the trailer. There it is. Um, unfortunately, that's not working. But imagine, if you will, some dialogue happening and characters talking back and forth with each other via text and a mystery being solved and a really engrossing storyline with very nice music. Um, that plays for about a minute, blah, 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 my name, and then we move on. Right. So, uh, as I said, this game was made in six months. Um, it was made in six months um, uh, for, for a few reasons. The main reason being uh, we had no time. Uh, we had a game prototype that we'd been taking around uh, to various different conferences, to various different uh, events, to try and pitch to a big publisher. Uh, it was a very big game, or it, it, it would be if we were allowed to make it. 
Uh, so we had this prototype, and it was working well. And we went to uh, DICE and GDC, which happened in the States um, in kind of um, February, March. And we'd had some interest. There were some publishers who were really into it. Unfortunately, they were publishers who were well known for being very, very slow. Um, some publishers aren't. Some publishers, you know, you'll do a deal at DevGam maybe uh, with a cool publisher, and you'll get the money uh, a month later. Th this is not the case, unfortunately, at the level of kind of budget we were talking about with people and the kind of scale we were trying to go to. So we had effectively six months that we knew we weren't going to be able to work. We had six months before this bigger project would happen. So we needed something to do in that time. Now, a lot of teams start making their game. Because you never know, right? The publisher, the publisher hopefully is going to come through with the money. You might as well get started, do your pre-production, do a bunch of other jobs. And then hopefully when the publisher pays you, uh, you're fine. We were a bit not cautious about doing that because uh, we kind of were worried, obviously, that a publisher deal might fall through. They might get complicated. It was something we didn't want to take the risk of doing. So we wanted to give ourselves these six months to do something else. We also didn't want to spend much money. <laughs> we had... Um, you know, we have a war chest from previous games, but we've already kind of set aside a lot of that money for other things that we want to make, other projects we're doing, other things that are on the back burner. So we didn't want to spend much cash on our six-month game. And finally, we had some creative things we wanted to play with. We knew that we wanted uh, to do more interesting narrative stuff. We wanted uh, to tell some stories where the player was making choices, where there was branching, where there were opportunities for you as a player to kind of decide what you want to do in our world. I don't know how many people in the room have, have how many people, in the, have anyone played Thomas Was Alone in the room? Thank you, thank you, thank you those people. Um, the rest of you should check it out, it's a very good game. Um, <laughs> you can skip volume. Um, so Thomas Was Alone, uh, we, you know, very linear game, very kind of straightforward story, um, volume same, and we wanted to do something a bit more interesting. So we had all these ideas kind of swirling around um, we also had uh, some, some people we wanted to work with who were available for six months. So we had all these things swirling around. We decided to make um, a small game. And we knew we had six months. That's why the timeline's there. And six months is nothing. Uh, we're at the start of March. And it took us that long to decide we wanted to do anything. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're already, we're kind of down to five months already, and we've not really started yet. Um, <laughs> so so that, that, that red bar will signify uh, the cr crushing doom of this project. Um, so, we've made a decision to do something. Uh, so we want to make a game, a short game. And, you know, if this is something you're thinking of doing, when I say a short game, I mean the time it takes to make, but I also actually more importantly mean the amount of content. We knew we were making a game that was going to take about an hour and a half. Uh, in the end, it's, it's about two hours long, because, you know, we did very well. But <laughs> it is only an hour and a half, and we didn't know... Um, who that was for. You know, we, we had this idea, we wanted to make a game that was an hour and a half, and we didn't want the internet to hate us. Uh, we didn't want to get, you know, anger everyone. So we started thinking about who should we make this game for? And I think this is an important stage in any development process, preferably at the start, to work out who your game's for. Who wants a game that lasts an hour and a half? Busy people. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel that I'm getting busier every day. I think that's partially just aging. Um, time feels shorter, the nights draw in. Um, but everyone's busy. Um, if you're not busy with real life, you're probably busy with games. PUBG probably is like alone, responsible for sucking up five to six hours of every gamer's life a day. Um, <laughs> there's some knowing laugh I saw in the, yeah, so yeah, you've experienced that, fair enough. Um, lots of people have, you know, have less time, effectively. And it made sense that maybe we can make a game that would be an hour and a half, and that that might actually appeal to a busy person. Because a busy person might be scared by a game that's going to take them 40 hours. But if we can go to them with a fairly priced hour and a half experience, maybe they're going to be interested. Parents, the busiest of people. This is something that's happening. And you see the, you see the, the, the stats go around the games websites every now and again, where they talk about, you know, more and more parents are playing games than ever have in the past, and the average gamer is now, I guess, 63. I mean, that number seems to go up and up and up. But generally, I think we all understand, especially in kind of the gamery games, the kind of the PC games, the console games, that the people playing them are aging. They are becoming parents. They are becoming uh, people with responsibilities. And therefore, we're seeing games targeting those people. 
Uh, you've got something like Uncharted, not Uncharted, uh, Last of Us, which has a, a parental story at the heart of it. You've got something like Horizon, which is actually dealing with kind of maternal instincts and kind of, uh, you know, being a mother, essentially, is a big theme of Horizon. These big games are realizing that we're starting to have kids, but somehow are still buying their games, and they are making games that appeal to what's interesting or important to those people. Unfortunately, those people have no time. So yes, you can play a game like Last of Us, which we'll talk about what it's like to be a dad, but it's gonna take you 15 hours, which you should be spending being a dad, you know? And there's a, there's a really interesting kind of trade-off that's happening in AAA where we're dealing with those story beats, but we are also making games that can't work for the people uh, necessarily who the themes are targeted at. And finally, adults. Adults in general, we know that the kind of people I'm talking about, the kind of the busier people, the parents, by definition, they're a bit older. They're, they're kind of a more adult audience. And I don't mean that in kind of a porn way. I mean that in more of a, the kind of stories they want to hear kind of way. They probably like, you know, TV dramas. They probably like uh, watching shows on Netflix. They like that kind of box set, bigger, more grown-up story that's dealing with more adult themes and more of a kind of a, a deeper sci-fi story would maybe work for them. So we bring all of that together, and we now have an idea of who our audience that we're targeting is. Um, we, we, by the way, we did manage this. You know, a lot of the Steam reviews, one of the Steam reviews, because our game is entirely mouse-driven, was referring to how easy it is to throw a kid over your shoulder while playing. Um, so he was playing it like, like that, I assume. Um, and, and that was a, a positive. So we, we clearly did find this audience, which is great. So knowing who the audience is and setting out now to make a text adventure, we started uh, going. So the first person who joins is a guy called Mu Yu, who's a programmer who I've been friends with for, uh, for many years, never worked with before. And he's making a game called Nights and Bikes, which is really cool. But he had this situation where he had a couple of months going spare and he, needed, he had about two days a week he could throw this. I'm sorry, that screen is incredibly bright, isn't it? Do you want to like, you've seen it, right? You've seen the slide. Should we move on to something darker? Or just move back, there we go. It's funny for me, because you all light up, it's great, it's like Christmas tree. Anyway, you saw that. So flowchart on the left, that's me starting to think through um, how dialogue would work in our game. How, how we can start uh, telling stories. And you can see, or you could see, if I was a cruel person, you could see um, uh, how the kind of the inventory system is starting to work, how the plan is starting to work. There's no game yet. It's just me trying to work out what I need from a dialogue perspective. Um, as a designer and coder, um, although I didn't code this project, I've coded enough games in the past that I like designers to be very specific about what they want so I can just do it. And with this one, I obviously I knew I was working with another coder, so I, I got straight to the flow charts and started kind of working out those systems. That gave him a basis he could start kind of planning from and thinking through. The other side, I'm going to put it on for a second. That side over there is me starting to work on a design doc. We don't do, I'm going to move it back because that is horrible. Um, <laughs> we've got a few white slides. We will do it like that, I promise. Um, so, so. Uh, yeah, I don't do big design docs. I'm not interested in that. I don't think that actually helps. If you do a 200-page game design doc, the only guarantee is that you're the only person who's ever going to read it. Um, and more importantly, a week after you've written it, it's already out of date because you've changed your mind or someone on the team came up with a better idea than you. You need to move the hell on. What we do is we do kind of smaller documents that are very focused, and it means that we can fo use that document until it stops being useful and then throw it away. The doc I was, I've got on the next slide there is, it's about five or six pages. It was the initial design doc for the game, and it's where we base a lot of our um, kind of design and ideas off of, and it worked well for us. So I'm gonna flick through the bright screen again. Sorry. <laughs> the thing is, if you're not hearing me in English, I didn't give you enough warning there. I'm sorry. Can you say sorry for me on the translation there? Yes, okay. Um, so, we've got the flow chart, we've got the design, we've got the ideas, that's kind of generally how things work. We're now heading into April, um, <laughs> and we've still not started making our game. Um, <laughs> but we, but we are, we're, we've made the right kind of decisions to plan out what, what the game actually is. Uh, so Moo gets to work, and he builds this, which is um, the dialogue system for subsurface circular, which is kind of a straightforward node system. The one on the left there 
is um, it, it's kind of the kind of a prototype version. The one on the right is actually a dialogue tree from the real game. So you can see that kind of at the start you've got kind of that the kind of you're making choices, but they're all kind of leading back to the same point. So it's kind of linear in that sense. Then you have a moment in the middle there with all the blue lines that remind me of the Horizon outfits. Um, those, that's your kind of a big dialogue tree moment where you can kind of decide what you want to talk about and all that stuff. And then we come down here and it gets a bit messier and a bit more kind of fluid. And that suddenly becomes this amazing tool that I can use to start designing conversations because I realize that essentially I'm designing levels. These dialogue trees are, are, are levels. So it's not a case of just writing a cool story and then putting in options. It's actually about thinking of dialogue in this kind of more level design way, which is great for me as a designer. I can really enjoy that. While I'm enjoying that and getting quite pretentious over in the corner, Moo can start actually coding it, so he, he gets on with that. He's working two-day weeks, but he's, he's getting through it. Um, and in the meantime, I'm starting to think about uh, UI and graphic design. Now, for me, um, I find doing the UI, I do it really early in the process. I start coming up with the UI of a game. You shouldn't really. You should start prototyping and playing and kind of find this stuff later. But for me, doing the UI work helps me to kind of work out how the game's going to play, especially with a game like this where it is basically all user interface, that you're, you're clicking buttons, you're reading text. It's really important that, that I've thought that through and that, that everything's working off of that. So you can see some interesting things here. Lots of stolen artwork, first of all. None of this is mine. Uh, that's scenes from Mr. Robot, which it's really hard to find. If you're making a game, if you ever find yourself making a game set on a subway train between two characters talking, it's very hard to find an image of that from any movie or TV show ever. This was the one image I found, and I used it everywhere in our kind of planning. Um, and then the right there, you can see me using, again, another piece of stolen artwork, off, probably off of Pinterest, um, and starting to think about logo, and that's actually quite similar to what the logo eventually would be. But what's interesting about this process is it's not just me kind of messing around or being daft. It's actually, you can see design happening in there in terms of where the, uh, where the options are, what pieces are still there. You can see a timer that was from a mechanic that we later decided was, was kind of pointless. You can see as well the dialogue coming towards the center of the screen. So originally the idea was the dialogue would show up next to the character speaking. And the problem with that was it's horrible to read because your eye has to keep going left and right across the screen. So we kind of brought that together. And this is before we've even made the game. You start just thinking through that design. The act of actually even putting together an interface, even if it's very early, uh, kind of helps. And the one on the bottom left there is pretty close to what the game kind of ended up looking like in the end. But you know, the code's happening. The game's starting to come together in terms of its mechanics. We're working out what we want to do. But there's still a lot more to be done on the visual side. So a guy called Gareth comes in, Gareth Davies, who's a great concept artist. He starts playing with these ideas. He, so he, we, we know it's about robots on a train. That's basically the brief I gave him. Um, and I've given him some reference imagery of kind of the kind of robots I like from sci-fi. And he starts playing. And you can see here. He's throwing everything at the wall. He's messing around with lots of different things. He's got kind of a core chassis, which we agreed on in terms of like what that, the, the legs and torso and arms would look like. And then he started kind of bolting different parts on and playing with that. Um, Gareth's great, but he, um, his style is kind of, it's definitely not photorealistic. It's definitely not something you could take that and make that as a, as a 3D object in a game because it, look, it would look weird, it wouldn't, it, would be, it wouldn't animate. A lot of the points that came up actually in the Horizon talk about rigging and stuff like that, the kind of the stuff you have to do to make something work comes into play. Uh, so someone called Daz Watford, which I'll show you some of his stuff in a moment, comes in and kind of polishes and cleans that up. So <laughs> we're into May. We are now, uh, yeah, about halfway through. Um, and Moose plugging away with the, with the code. The game is basically made from a code perspective at this point. Uh, there's lots of things he's still implementing, save systems, stuff like that. But generally, you can, you can play a, a bit of dialogue through and make choices and have that interaction. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I've started writing. We're going through that process. Um, now it's time to actually start kind of finishing things up because we are, we are halfway through, as I said. So Daz comes in. And this is where you can see uh, the kind of practicalities uh, of game development ha happening. So this is uh, Daz taking the artwork that Gareth's done and working out how to make it actually work in a game context. Um, so he's, he's working out how the joints work. He's working out uh, how to actually make this thing 
walk around, make it so it can walk around so an animator can use it. He's locking down things like the wrist and the, and the, way, the way joints work and stuff like that. Some of this stuff won't make it into the final game, um, but most of it does. And that just leads to us being able to hand this, because this is something I can hand to a 3D artist and get made. Um, unlike the kind of the, the looser stuff from earlier. You need the looser stuff to kind of arrive at what the solution's gonna be, but it's, you have to go through this as well to kind of work that through. At the same time, uh, so a guy called Dan Lassac, um, who is a music producer who I've been a fan of since I was a teenager, used to do uh, everything with Scroobius Pip. I'm sure Scroobius Pip has not made it over to Belarus. That's fair enough, um, but he's a, he's a British rapper. Um, <laughs> he's quite good. As, as terrible as the idea of a British rapper sounds, he's quite good as far as British rappers go. Um, so Dan Lassac uh, is, is cool. He's a streamer and he's a music producer. And I kind of ask him if I can license a piece of his music, a, a track called Frederick. Uh, he asks about the game, he gets into the game, and then we decide together that he should kind of collaborate on actually creating some new stuff. So that's cool. And that's all happening, yeah, about three months before the game comes out. As you can tell, things are ramping up now. We're actually starting to believe this game might be decent. We're actually thinking this game might be worth putting a little bit of money into, so that's how we're starting to get more artists, more music, stuff like that. Um, and we start to go into 3D at this point. Uh, so that concept art that Daz has done is now something that can be translated. You'll notice, or you, you may not, but it's worth looking at later. Uh, there are tweaks that happen at the 3D stage. The character gets um, cleaned up, streamlined, kind of smoothed off in such a way that allows it to work. We also, at this, make, make, at this point, make a terrible rookie mistake. Um, most video games, it's something you don't really think about until you've got, you, you're doing it. Most video games, the characters stand up. They walk around, they run, they hit something, they shoot something, they jump, you know, they're doing this kind of... One thing characters in games don't often do, unless you're making kind of bigger games, is sit down. And we had made the very embarrassing rookie mistake of making the seats too low. Um, they looked good, but for the robots we made with the really long robot -y legs, when a robot sat down, its knees were like up up by its elbows, like it was just kind of in this weird contorted position. So we had to jump in and change that mesh, and genuinely it was a massive waste of time and money, um, <laughs> but we got there in the end. Because we hadn't bothered, because we'd been foolish, to ever check if the chair fit the robot that we were, we were drawing and concepting. So don't make that mistake. Um, <laughs> it's actually a really good example of why you should do uh, what the guys on Horizon did, where you do environment and characters simultaneously so you don't run into those kind of problems. Again, though, we were rushing. <laughs> so we made, those, uh, we made all those mistakes. So it's coming up to June. <laughs> we're now in June. And I'm writing the art. The 3D art is kind of done at this stage, which is good. I'm kind of racing through this because we've got there's, um, some other stuff later. Everything's kind of coming together in a good way. We get the animator in, a guy called Tim Borelli. Um, now, what's really interesting about the animation side of this game is uh, we had no time and we had no money, uh, which is the theme of this presentation. So we had to work out how we could have visual variety between these robots. Now, if you play the game, all the heads in game are different shapes. Uh, we also have different colors on the robots, but we knew that wasn't enough. Um, and we wanted them to have different poses and different sit in different ways and sit in ways that reflected their character. You can see there's very slight variations in the way they're sitting and standing. Uh, these are actually probably quite kind of the dullest poses, but we've got some poses that have like their arms up, some poses where they're sat up, you know, doing different things. But we also had the problem of if we did that, we had to make a lot of animation because you have to have the character walk in, sit down, stand up, walk out. If you have lots of different poses, you have to make that work for every single pose they're going into. You have to make the kind of the breathing loops and stuff for the individual poses. If you're doing it like The Witcher, where you're making an enormous library of animation that you can then blend between to get a good performance, that, that would be a problem. And again, we have no time and no money. Uh, so what we decided to do was we, we relied on automation as much as we could. So there aren't any animations or loops in Subsurface Circular. The characters have a walk cycle, um, and that's it, really, in terms of animation. They have, like, there's a, a moment in the game later on where a, a bespoke animation plays. But basically, they walk in and out, and then when the second they sit in a chair or stand up, they freeze just in a, in a one frame pose. Very quick to do. And then what we do is on top of that, we layer on um, 
looking code, so making them look around the carriage, look at each other, do their own thing. We have a second pose for each pose, so if, if the characters there are sat down, they have the si sitting down and they have like a leaning forward listening pose, both one frame, and we blend between that so you get the robot kind of ducking in and out to conversation, which we can use in conversation to make it look like they're more or less engaged. A lot of this, by the way, we get away with because they're robots, so you kind of accept it. We then do a thing which I'm particularly proud of, which is very cheeky, where we take, so the look around code, if anyone's used look around in Unity, it kind of tilts the body towards whatever they're looking at. It's quite nice, it's, it does the job. But what I realized was if I made the point they were looking at wobble a little bit, I could make them breathe. So I put in, so I put in a little bit of code. It's the one bit of code I wrote in the game. Um, I put in a little bit of code that just wobbled their look at point slightly. And it creates the illusion that they're kind of bouncing around on the train or breathing. And it's just enough that you don't notice there's no animation in the game. And I've not seen anyone comment on it. I've not seen anyone like, please don't go and comment on the Steam page about this. Um, I've got away with it. There's, and I'm quite proud of it. It's one of, those, one of the kinds of tricks you come up with when you are working in, in six months on a game. And this is my life. I'm sorry, I'm going to put it back. OK. Again, just very briefly. So this is me. I'm writing. Um, I'm just going to get rid of that immediately. So I'm writing the, the script for the game. And the script for the game is massive. It's, a, it's a, about a two-hour game. And it's played out, as you've seen, kind of like an instant messenger conversation. That translates to about 50 pages of linear text in terms of the initial writing of those, that conversation. But then once you start doing branching, obviously that number goes up very high. Um, essentially, Subsurface Circular is about the length of a novel in terms of the writing I had to do for it, uh, which I swished into about two months, uh, which was really stupid um, and tied myself out. Um, the way it worked for me with this game was I wrote out basically like a linear version of the script. So I wrote out basically a two hour short story of kind of how this would all play out. And then I used that as a backbone from which to build all the, all the different branches, all the different stuff you would do. Uh, that worked reasonably well. It kind of, it was a way of doing it in a realistic amount of time. It did lead to a certain linearity in the game, uh, which if and when we return to this idea Is there a party about to start? That scares me, because that, that feels like that's, that's how they're going to get me off the stage. They're just going to release all of that confetti at some point. Let's move on. It's fine. Um, yeah, it kind of led to a kind of a line more linear experience than we were aiming for. Um, and that's definitely something I'm going to look at, I think, before I do future projects and kind of see if that method actually is forcing us to be less kind of creative, I guess. I'm going to flick through the script page very briefly. Cool. It is scary. Um, <laughs> Going black to white to black was, was foolish of me. I should have stayed kind of mid-tones. Um, press strategy. So this is an interesting one. We, we had a problem. This was, the kind of, this was one of our meltdown moments. So this is towards the end of June, start of July, which is the point on a six-month game where I start thinking about PR. I should have thought about PR a lot earlier, but it's about the point where I realized, oh, no, we're actually going to release this. Um, we need to not mess up the release and embarrass ourselves massively publicly. Um, so I sit down with the team, and we start chatting about this, and we start thinking about kind of where we're at with it. And the biggest problem we have is we've made a short game. And those don't really exist. Um, there, there are obviously kind of episodic games. There are smaller games. But in terms of marketing something specifically as, hey, guys, here's a two-hour game you play once. That's not something that really exists, because you can't go out into the world and say that to a gamer, because they'll say, well, where's the replayability? Why, why, are, you, why are you here? How'd you get in here? Um, don't tell me that. That was our problem. And it was actually a problem for two reasons. The first reason, of course, was that we knew we were going to have to kind of really work hard to not annoy the internet and get the internet to kind of feel that we'd been lazy or made something that was too cheap or whatever. And we knew the other side of that was that because players weren't expecting us to make a small game, they might design a bigger game in their head. You know, we had this, we'd seen this a lot with, other, with a lot of my friends, um, releasing indie games uh, that were overhyped. They got built up massively. Um, in some cases, that leads to the developer having to add stuff, like um, with Cuphead, where they had to go back and add a bunch of kind of uh, platforming levels because the community expected that when they saw the, the footage. Um, with other devs, it meant when the game came out, the game was held up against this kind of impossible hype machine that happened. 
um, and, and of course kind of suffered from the comparison. We knew we didn't, hadn't made something that was so mind-blowingly cool. If you saw it in a trailer, you would invent a bigger game. But we also knew that our dialogue system looked interesting, and our characters looked pretty cool and well-rendered. And it was very easy to look at a screenshot or a video of our two-hour game and think, oh, it's Mass Effect. Um, or like cheap Mass Effect, like indie Mass Effect. And we were terrified that that, especially as around this time was when Mass Effect had just come out and there was kind of a, a negative reaction to that. We were terrified that we would be perceived as bigger than we were and then we would absolutely disappoint the audience. Our solution was to not tell the audience the game existed. Um, our solution was uh, what we called in the team beyond saying it. Uh, we decided not, we decided just to drop it, just to literally launch the game one day with no expectation from the audience, just say, here it is, get it out there um, and surprise everyone. And that's not special. <laughs> you know, the, the, the default way a game is released on Steam by an indie is they just release it. Um, but for us, because obviously we've had some success in the past, um, we would normally do kind of more press, we'd go to events, we'd demo it to people, we'd, we'd have interviews and previews and all that fun and games. By not doing that, it was actually something weird and surprising to the audience. Um, and it kind of played into it for a few reasons. It helped us in a lot of ways. It meant that we, um, we, we became a story because we were releasing out of nowhere. It meant that it became kind of this weird social capital. If, if you'd played the game, you knew about the game and you had an opinion about the game. There was some value to that, which meant things, weird things, like we got crazy number of Steam reviews, a much higher percentage of people play Subsurface Circular and review it than most other games. A, because it's short and you can get to the end, and B, because there was no hype going into it. Suddenly, every gamer out there could be someone up with the first review of the game. And that seemed to help kind of get it, get momentum, get it trending on Twitter, that kind of thing. Um, of course, what we also did was send it out to some press outlets so there'd be some legitimate reviews at launch just because we didn't want people to think we were lying to them or trying to trick them into buying a bad game uh, by not having that information out there. But we decided to take it carefully with that. The other, of course, the other great part of this is it kind of required less work from us. We just had to finish the game at this point. Once we decided that that was the way to go, I didn't have to go to events, I didn't have to fly anywhere and do anything. I could just finish the game and that was good. So now we're heading into Polish. So it's July, the game is out. Uh, August, we set our date to August 17th, uh, which is a month, uh, two, month, two years, sorry, two years to the day after our last game came out on PC, which is a weird coincidence that worked out well. Seems to be when we like releasing games. But honestly, we picked that release date because there wasn't anything else out that day. And the games that were out either side of us kind of were different. I think Sonic was released a few days before us, the good, the good one. Um, was released a few days before us, uh, the 2D one, and we realized like the Sonic player and the text adventure pretentious indie sci-fi game audience were probably a little different, and we would be okay with that. So we start polishing, and anyone in the room who's released a game knows how much how dull this process is. Um, but effectively, um, yeah, it's all the stuff you don't want to do. So the settings screen, um, we, <laughs> but more importantly, playtesting. Playtesting was a really big part of that last month. Uh, we went to players, we went to um, people uh, in industry that we trusted to keep the secret, and we gave them copies of the game, and we asked them what they thought. And uh, it, it went pretty well, but there were definitely kind of some roadblocks. There were definitely some problems in the game. Uh, we sent them the first half of the game first uh, to get their feedback on the kind of the first hour, uh, and then we tweaked and changed things based on their feedback and then gave them the second half. And because of that, we were able to see, okay, we've actually fixed a lot of the issues. Uh, the major one was the hint system. Uh, so we added two hint systems to the game uh, where people, wherever people got stuck, we went in and we kind of tweaked puzzles and added explanations and added stuff that made that frame that better for them. Again, in a six month game, that's quite hard to get playtest data acted on. But because of the because it was text based, we could do that very quickly and iterate. Uh, we built in kind of a, a hint system that's always there, kind of an ever present question mark in the game's UI. But we also built in dialogue options that let you kind of skip the harder puzzles but not feel like you were cheating, which was good. Um, we also then uh, did uh, QA as well, which is um, which is, is a tough process. Uh, we got because of because the game was quite small again. We could find we found a. Um, a QA person from Media Molecule who was on maternity leave because she just had a kid. 
Um, but she's a great QA person. So what we did was we went to her and said, do you want to do like an hour a day? Um, and she was up for it. Uh, so we, we, uh, we managed to have kind of a QA person who, and you know, put a bit more cash in her pocket, which was nice, but also get a really experienced person who would break our game and avoid uh, launch problems. So now we're up to launch. Uh, launch proper is, is coming up. And it is, it is time. Uh, it is time to do, uh, well, in our case, uh, press release. So it's August the 8th. Uh, so we're about a week before the law game actually comes out properly. Um, I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but I'll put it up on screen. So this is what our press release was. Uh, <laughs> it mentions, please don't tell anyone this is out until the date about five times. But essentially, what we did was we, we found games journalists who uh, were into these kind of games or who liked our previous games, uh, more importantly, games journalists who liked these kind of games, uh, and sent them Steam keys about a week beforehand and said, you know, please review it if you can, or at least just kind of get a sense for it. Because we knew that when the game came out, because it was going to be a surprise, that, that the audience would probably react going, well, I'm not buying it until someone tells me it's OK. I don't want to, I don't want to risk buying a game that could be crap. Um, and what this allowed us to do was to uh, make sure that there would be knowledgeable people who weren't, you know, who were going to be trusted by the audience well ahead of time. So we sent some YouTubers as well. We just wanted people out there who who would uh, who would play the game and see if it was good or bad. And if it was bad, then we were screwed either way. But if it was good, that they would be able to tell people and and, and share that with for us. And it worked really well. And no one leaked it. Uh, although one person came very close to, but fortunately she didn't in the end, which is good. Um, so release day happened, uh, August 17th. So all of this work has culminated. We have a game. It's done for PC and Mac. It's on Steam. Um, but there's still work to be done leading into this launch. And I think this is a, a really important part. The Steam page is where we sell our game. Um, our stats show this. Like, people don't... Lots, oh, lots of people buy subsurface circular by seeing it mentioned on, a, on YouTube videos or on websites. But whatever happens, they're going to have to come through the Steam page. Um, and therefore, it's really the place we talk to our audience. Uh, we, dis we made a decision, and it's tied back to our, our, all our fears about overhyping the game. We made a decision to absolutely undersell the game. So this Steam page is purposefully designed, and it's still like this, to actively try and put you off. Um, it's designed to tell you, um, in a very friendly way, all the things that you as a gamer might not like about it, so that if any of these kind of words trigger you to be like annoyed, uh, you go away um, and you don't buy it. Because crucial to what we're trying to do here is we want this game to be liked. We want this game to be well received. We don't honestly care how many people buy it in launch week. It doesn't actually matter. The, more, the far more important metric for us as a company that makes lots of games and you know, games that have much bigger budgets and come out uh, with much more time between them, our objective is reputation. It's really important to us that we're seen to be a good company that makes good games. I don't know why I did quotation marks. We are a good company that does good games. Um, <laughs> I should be proud of myself. Um, <laughs> should not be more proud of myself. Um, so this is designed to put you off. The reason being, if you don't buy the game, if you just see this and go, you know what, I'm not into text adventure games about robots, um, then you go away and you don't buy the game, feel wronged by us, feel that we've taken your money, leave a bad Steam review, go on a forum, tell everyone how we're awful. What this does is it means we got the real fans. We got the real people who wanted a game of this genre to buy our game, and therefore that's why our game is, yeah, 96% positive reviews. Not enough yet to go into overwhelmingly positive, but it will once, once we hit that number. And that's not because this game is 96% perfect. It definitely isn't. It def it's definitely not that excellent. But because we've been very careful about making sure the audience who will like it play it, we, we have a, a better reputation. And that's good. That's, that's good. No one, everyone's paid money for the thing they want to play. No one feels wronged. I can sleep well at night knowing that, uh, that no one hates me. Well, people probably hate me, but not for this reason. Um, so yeah, so the game's out now. Uh, we've had a lot of success with that, that approach, so much so that when we decided to do an iPad port, um, Apple came to us and asked us to do exactly the same thing there. Uh, so with iPad, we did a very low-key surprise launch, uh, and you know, 
uh, you know, kept the text. I think the text is very similar to what's here on the iPad store and has had exactly the same result. The game is, I think, almost unanimously 5% reviews. I think it's like a 4.9 or something because one person gave it a three-star review. Curses. It's great, but it's a bit short. We've, been, we've done a lot of work to tell you about that up front, but fair enough. You still fell through the cracks. That's fine. Um, so it's working well for us, this kind of the modesty. And the way that, the, the, I mean, that's a very specific approach to us because obviously we have a reputation so we can afford to do that. We also decided we didn't care if we made money, which is, you know, something that's a massive luxury. But I do think there's a lesson here about underselling and over delivering, about presenting games uh, that are modest. Because we're all, if you're an indie like me, you don't have the budget to make Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, and players are smart. They'll realize that you've not. You know, they'll realize what your game is actually when they play it. Um, so giving them a realistic expectation and then exceeding it by doing something particularly well within that limited criteria, I think it's a way of indies making really cool stuff. Uh, and I would encourage you to do so. And that is the end of my talk. And I'd like to do some questions if people are up for it. I hear there's prizes. I don't know if there's, is there prizes for these questions? I saw Horizon Zero Dawn, there were prizes. Um, yeah, I'm happy to do Q&A about anything that anyone wants to ask questions about. Um, anything to do with any of my games, anything to do with what I've talked about today, whatever you want to ask. There's a microphone there with no one in front of it. I think, do you go to the microphone or do we hand microphones out? People have to come down apparently. So if you want to ask a question, uh, come down, form a, form a queue. I hate making people move. The answers have to be really good to justify the effort these people are making. Uh, okay, and I'm going. Yeah, and, and I unfortunately I only speak English because I'm awful and British, and I'm sorry. I feel ignorant and horrible whenever I visit any other country. Hello. Yes. Uh, hello. Thanks for a nice topic. Uh, my you. question is about the tools did, that did you use uh, for this development. It's a qu quite small game, uh, short period of time. So, what tools you choose for this one? So this game, um, Unity is the game engine. Um, the main reason for Unity is I've been using it for eight years now. Jeez, I've been using Unity for eight years. Because um, back when I started, Thomas was alone. You were either using Flash or Unity, and Unity seemed like it had more of a future than Flash, which I chose right, so that's good. Um, so we just stuck to Unity because that's what I know, that's what my team knows. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a cool engine. You can achieve cool things with it. Um, outside of the engine itself, uh, tools-wise, we didn't use a lot of um, any kind of external assets simply because we only had six months and we didn't want to risk you know, someone else's stuff breaking our game. So there's not actually many assets in there. Um, we did, though, uh, you know, for the writing, I used Google Docs. Uh, that node system you saw there was made entirely bespoke uh, by the coder. Um, it's a really cool tool, actually. We should probably try and sell that at some point because it's lovely. Um, <laughs> it's only getting better as we play with it. Um, but yeah, so that node system, but that's built off of Unity's back end, allows for a lot of that. Like that, he didn't build nodes from scratch. He, he kind of sat on top of something else. Um, and then it's just Photoshop. I use Illustrator for graphic design. Um, art wise, I always forget the name of the tool the 3D artist uses. No, it's not Maya or Max or Blender. Modo. Is it Modo? Modo, it's Modo. Um, yeah, so, so those are the tools. So nothing that exciting, to be completely honest. Um, but just with this, because of the short turnaround, just a bunch of tools that me and my mates already used so that we could just kind of build something quickly. Because we didn't really, we wanted to do new stuff from the game design perspective and from the writing perspective. But on other areas, we didn't have time to take a risk. And we didn't have budget to go wrong. So okay. that's the, okay. no worries. Awesome. Hello. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. I've got a quite a specific question. Awesome. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you showed us the node system, the dialogue system, and uh, this is like the flow of the dialogue uh, that is short term. Is mm. the uh, long term decisions in the game, dialogue decisions, that affect the game entirely? And if it is, how do, does you like? What is your approach to this problem? So yeah, it's a good question. So what we do um, is, yeah, you saw, so yes, you're right. You saw one, one dialogue thread. 
and you have these different characters all coming on the train at once. Oh, by the way, anyone else who wants to join the queue for questions, feel free. Um, please, <laughs> makes me feel special. Um, you've got all these different other characters around you, right? And it's what we do is we have moment-to-moment -moment dialogue, which feeds into shared variables. That's how we do it. So what we have is we have uh, overall uh, just a, basically a list of things we're tracking. Um, that character was annoyed by something you said. Uh, you made the decision to help that character. You did this, you did that. Very straightforward. Most of them binary. Most of them just kind of, you did this or you didn't. Um, and then we have all of those variables being saved and stored in a global context. And then dialogue uh, can, has logic gates, essentially, that checks those variables. So a, a piece of dialogue in the game can both change those variables on the fly, but also can use those variables as a condition. So, you know, so I, I can get very nerdy with you on this. One second. Let me go back to the diagram. Could be a few white screens. There you go. Um, so let's go back. There we go. So for example, um, I don't know if this is true, but let's say you see the one couple of rows up with three yellow prongs coming down from it. So with those, that could be a decision. That it's just presenting those three options. Or it could be the logic on that one could be choose the first I can viably use. So the first node might have a, so it might be a thing where you say, oh, you know, do you have a hat? And the other character does the first option they can say back to you is, yes, I have a hat. But that checks a variable to see if their hat's been stolen or not. And if their hat hasn't been stolen, then they say that. If they have, if, if it has, then they go on to the next one. So it's very straightforward. It's almost like back when I was writing stuff in QBasic. Like it's very simple, childish stuff. And there's a reason for that. And the main reason for that is so it's fast for the writer. Because we wanted to build this tool that would allow me to very quickly go, you know what, it'd be cool if like in the first level you could do this. And then in the fifth level, someone would remember that that thing had happened. And if that was any, in any way more complex than just checking, you know, me, basically me setting a variable to true in, 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 the, in the scripting on a specific node, then it might not happen. And we wanted to make sure, I'm a big believer that tools kind of decide how you, what you make. You make the thing that can be made with the tool. If you're holding an ax, you're going to chop some wood. Like there's no, that you, you're the, we, we, we build with what we have. Uh, so it was about making those tools really straightforward. So it's simplistic, but it works. Um, but there's definitely lots of room to take that in interesting directions for future Thank stuff. Thank you very much. No worries at all. Oh, we got a Frisbee. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Max, and uh, I have a question about creating an animation for the short games. Hmm. Have you thought about using the mockup system like Kinect for creating uh, the base animation before blending? And uh, if you have, have you, uh, can you tell me about the main advantages and disadvantages of these systems? Yeah, so I've never, let me just check this is true in my head. Yeah, I've never, I've never for any of my indie projects used mocap data that I myself have recorded. In a previous life when I was working, I worked very briefly on um, uh, kar the karaoke revolution games for Konami. Uh, which anyone who, no one in the room will remember these, but they were terrible. Um, but lots and lots of mocap data because you had performers kind of dancing around on the stage. The, 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 issue, the biggest issue I have with mocap data is the, t is the cleanup. Uh, is, and, and depending on, on how good the system of recording is, the cleanup goes up massively. If you're working with a really great mocap studio, you spend a lot of money, but they will do all of the cleanup for you. They'll give you a great bunch of files of really clean mocap. If you're using something like you say, like something kind of like Connect or something yeah. that that's very kind of um, a very loose kind of system, you end up with data that sort of isn't as good as an animator making it from scratch would be, um, it, and, and needs so much cleanup by a skilled animator that you might as well have got the animator to it. There is a middle ground though that's really cool and no one knows about, as far as I know. Um, it's well worth uh, everyone in the room who wants to use it. Um, it's called Mixamo. Have you heard of Mixamo? Yeah. Yeah, so Mixamo, for people who haven't heard of it, is it was a big mocap uh, com outsourcing company, and it made um, just a bunch of mocap data, and you could buy it. like It was like $10 an animation, $20 an animation, and you could also make requests. You could say, I want an animation of this, and they, I assume, would go to the mocap studio that was in their office. Steve from accounting would go like that. They'd record it. They'd sell it to you, and then they'd sell it to anyone else who wanted it. That was what Mixamo was about three or four years ago. What happened, though, was Mixamo got bought by Adobe. 
to make Photoshop and Illustrator. So if you have an Adobe license now, you can go on Mixamo.com and you can download every piece of mocap data Mixamo ever made for free. Uh, and no one knows this, or I, I think some people know this, but not enough people know this. It's not a case anymore of spending $10 for a piece of mocap data. You can literally grab everything. And yes, you're paying for an Adobe uh, membership if you're not already, then that would be a cost. But if you are paying for that already, just go and grab a bunch of free mocap. A volume, which was my stealth game, was about 70% Mixamo mocap data. And the great thing about buying from someone like Mixamo is they've already cleaned it all up. So, so my to answer your original question, I think I think homebrew mocap is still early enough that I worry about it not producing the kind of results that like a great animator can. Um, I think that's changing. I see that getting better and better with every iteration of of this of this technology. I'm even looking at the um, the new iPhone X, the um, that animated. Um, I'm sorry, I'm over 30. They're called emoji, right? The animated emoji thing uh, that you can do in that, where it follows your face. I'm looking at that and thinking, like, I kind of want to make a version of that that exports to Maya, because that's some light facial animation. You could get away with that on like a third-person game with a character like that big on screen. You could probably like use that mocap data, that facial capture data. So I think that stuff's coming along. I don't think it's quite there yet. And from my perspective. Um, I'm kind of risk averse, and I kind of I worry about like the the impact of making those those decisions. Thank you very much. No worries at all. Thanks for the question. Oh, we got a T-shirt. Hello. Hello. Uh, it's maybe very uh, hard question. How you write the stories? <laughs> so it's all about uh, Thomas was alone. I see. Uh, some figures. What, what, what is it? What is it? And I'm playing. Oh, it's a very good story. But Thank about you. figures. How, how do you? How, how do you? How? How, how do you how. write stories? <laughs> Have we got like three hours? So how so it's could... used to write stories and uh, make these characters? Okay, I will try. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, there's no one behind you. And as far as I know, I've got till half past. Right? Mm -hmm. I got till half past. Twenty-five. How long? How long have I got to answer this question so I can answer it well? <laughs> Five minutes. Eight minutes. Okay, let's do yeah. stories with Mike. I'm just gonna sit on the end of the stage. No, um, <laughs> uh, storytelling. So um, there's no right way. Is obviously the thing that people always say. Do what you feel. Find your own voice. That works if you're a genius. I'm not. So I'm a hack. Um, I I I'm, I do things in a very straightforward way. So for me, there's two sides of it. And the, the big one is because obviously we're writing game stories. I assume you're a game, you're making games, right? And you're not making films. So, so there's, a, there's a side of this which is the player as well. And you have to be mindful of that. You can't just write the mm. best Hollywood movie ever and then put first person shooter controls into it. That's not gonna work. That's gonna, that's gonna feel really frustrating as it took Call of Duty about 10 years to realize. And the new Call of Duty actually is really well written. It's quite, it's quite good. Um, but yeah, 10, 10 years of Call of Duty, not so good on that. Um, I, dissing the work of hundreds of very talented people on stage. That's not good. Pull it back. Um, so there's two sides of this. Mm. But the main thing is character motivation. So character motivation is the one side, and plotting is the other. And the two feed into each other. So when you're writing a story, character motivation is why does Bob want to do this thing? And, 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 and why does he feel this way and who, how is he, why, why is he how he is? And plotting is, and then this really cool thing happened. And then this cool thing happened, which they weren't expecting, but then this thing happened. And if you can get both sides of that working, you're onto a good story. So character motivation first. The easiest character to know the motivation of is the player, right? Because the player is playing a video game. So they're there to do whatever it is you've made your game do. So if you're making a first person shooter, your player wants to shoot people. That's their motivation in the world. They want to shoot people. Now, as a writer, your job is to think, well, you know, maybe why does the character want to shoot people? It doesn't really matter, to be completely honest. When was the last time you cared about the backstory of your first-person shooter protagonist? It, it can come up, but generally, you need to work out how to align the player with that character. This is true of all protagonists in all genres. Why does Mario want to jump? Mario wants to jump because he's in a world where that's how you have to move to get around. He's, he, he, doesn't, he, he didn't get to choose to jump. Jumping was forced upon him. But also, you know, he, he loves the princess, so he wants to go and save the princess. Simplest narrative ever. He, he's motivated to save his girlfriend. 
And that's kind of cliche, kind of old fashioned, but it works. Um, with something like Thomas Was Alone, let me go through this for you. So Thomas Was Alone, uh, for those who are not familiar with it, it is literally a game about rectangles with feelings. Um, and the way that, that was written from a character perspective was, what does each of these characters want? So there's a character called Claire. Claire is a blue square who floats in water. And there's not much story there. Until you realize she's the only character in this world who has ever floated in water. So she's a fucking superhero. She's Tony Stark. She's Superman. I just swore. She is, um, I hope they didn't translate the swear. Um, it's probably fine. Um, so she's a superhero. So she reacts to this moment of I can float in water by thinking I, I'm, a, I'm a hero. I need to save people. And then from that point on as a character, I can write her because I understand how she's going to react to things. She's going she's to see people in distress, and she's going to want to be a superhero. And she's going to realize she can't save people, and that's going to give her turmoil and trouble. And she's going to realize that with great power comes great responsibility, and she can do the whole thing. Um, likewise, uh, John, who's this yellow, tall rectangle who jumps really high, well, he'd be arrogant, wouldn't he? Because he can jump really high. He's cool. He's, al he's, he's always been good at sports. He's a jock. He's, he's, a, he's a very arrogant character who wants to show off. Um, so I can write that. But what happens when John then meets Claire, um, who's better than him, and he's an actual superhero? Maybe he's going to be a bit jealous. Maybe he's going to realize maybe he's not the best guy in the world. And you kind of realize these characters just flowing. Mm -hmm. And it's all about their actions. It's all about, because we're making action, we're making games where you enact things. Um, John McClane in Die Hard is defined by what he does in the world, by, by his actions. And games are the same. You're defining characters by what they do. And you should work out why they want to do what they want to do and how them doing what they do would affect those around them. Then plotting comes in. Plotting is how you tell a satisfying story that goes, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. That one's actually much easier because people have shared opinions on this, and there's a reason all movies have the same structure now. It's because that works. And all my games have the classic hero's journey structure which you can find in a million awful books about screenwriting. Just genuinely find a book that's like how to write a movie, how to, how to tell your screenplay in 20 minutes or whatever. They're awful books. But Hero's Journey is that classic thing. There's a situation of normalcy. Everything's fine. Nothing could go wrong here. A terrible thing happens. A hero must rise. He must go on a journey. He goes on a journey. He has an objective, which is X. But then as he's going on his journey, he realizes that really isn't life about why. Why? Yeah, I should change. I should grow as a human being. Maybe falls in love along the way. Uh, then about three quarters of the way through, uh, something terrible happens. It looks like the hero's going to lose. It's called his darkest hour. He, he's on the ground. He's, his super suit has run out of energy. He's doomed. How could he possibly win? And then he wins. And then he goes back to the normal situation. Everyone goes, you're awesome. That's every movie you've seen in the last 20 years, and it's fine, and it works, and it's satisfying. It, it, it's, it satisfies us on a narrative level. And that structure is in Thomas Was Alone, it's in volume, it's definitely in Subsurface Circular. Find those beats and hit them, because honestly, biologically, turns out humans, we're not that awesome. We like, we like having satisfying stories told to us in the same way over and over again. Um, and if you're a genius writer, then you can do better you can come up with something that's innovative and awesome and brilliant. But if, like me, you're someone who sort of isn't a genius, but just kind of wants to make video games because it's really fun and I suck at everything else, um, then, then doing a kind of a hack approach, which is what I've just described, of kind of telling a satisfying journey for a hero, it works and people like it. Um, and then you can subvert and do tweaks and work out fun twists on that. But knowing the rules and then breaking them is much better than just going for whatever you want. You're much more likely to hit something cool. So if you can make that work over here with plotting, and you can have characters in that plot that behave in a way that makes sense, but are also true to themselves and are motivated by whatever they're motivated about, and change and grow and realize, you know, I used to think I was awesome, but now I realize I need to work as a team. That's about 50% of the movies you've seen in the last 20 years. Like, that's, if you can build all of that together and make those two things not contradict each other so the audience isn't going, but Bob hates cars. Why is he a driver now? That makes no sense. Because that happens. People try and cram characters into a plot that makes no sense for them, or try and cram plot into characters that make no sense. If you can make all that work together, you're most of the way there. And then it's just writing dialogue. 
And dialogue is mainly about remembering that the audience, that, that people don't actually talk directly. They talk, they bounce off each other, they have their own reason for being in a conversation. You're, you're stood there uh, asking questions because you want to learn, you want to know something. I'm stood here talking to you because I like the sound of my own voice. And it's nice to come to this country. Thank you for having me. Um, we have different objectives. We're not here to tell a story to this audience. We have different things we want. And then you write dialogue in a way that reflects that. Because you're trying to do one thing, I'm trying to do another thing. Maybe we work together, maybe we have a fight. It can go in lots of different directions. And that's how to write stories in eight minutes with Mike Bithell. I think that's probably it. Yeah. That was fun. I think that was actually better than the talk. I should take that and make that the talk. That'd be quite good. Anyway, thank you very much for the question. Great question. Thank you. I don't know if you're going to get a Frisbee or a t-shirt. Which will it be? It's a Frisbee. There you go. Okay. Um, I think that's it.